maybe I should not stand in front of the slides, maybe I, I go here as well, moderator. And yes, it's true, I, I brought along many questions. Many questions, and I don't know if I'm going to be irritable, but I hope that at least I'm going to be inspiring with, or these questions are going to be inspiring. What's the purpose of a company? What's the purpose of the economy? Yes, I brought along a purposeful business model as part of a purposeful economic model. The economy for the common good is a holistic vision on the whole economy, and as part of that, we <laughs> think that we find better answers to the question, what might be the purpose of a company? You know what company means? I'm a linguist, by the way, so be aware. <laughs> Watch out. Company cum pane, to break bread together. Isn't that a nice endeavor? Is it worth undertaking? <laughs> wow, let's say. <laughs> um, entreprise, it's similar. It's taking something in between your hands. Entreprendre. Corporation, let's form a bigger body than ours. <laughs> Not bad either. Mm. And what's the purpose of the economy? Of the greater body, the macro body. Is it to make GDP grow forever, endlessly, 5% per year for the next 5,000 years? How big would this body be then in 5,000 years? Is this purpose? Is this? Yes, it is purposeful, but it, but it is meaningful. Growth, endless growth might be considered a purpose, but it is a meaningful purpose. It was Kate Rayberth who, who gave us the hint that uh, economics textbooks do not include long-term projections of GDP. <laughs> they champion GDP, sorry, they champion GDP, but they don't give an answer where GDP will be in 100 years, in 1,000 years, in 10,000 years. So if we don't know what's the purpose of the economy, I think we are in a crisis, aren't we? And there are so many crises, and they are, they are becoming even more that I <laughs> jump over the crisis. Oh, there is another crisis chart. I think I jump over that as well, and I jump over... Oh, yes, but uh, maybe that's an interesting information. Um, in early 2020, just before the outbreak of the pandemic, it was for the first time in, in the short history of the survey of Edelman Agen Agency that a global majority of surveyed and asked people answered that capitalism is doing more harm than good for the first time. And it was already before that scenario and landscape of crisis was getting bigger and bigger. So with that, I think that it's not just a, a small minority at the fringe or a, an avant-garde as us. Can I have that hat, please? <laughs> <laughs> so it's not only us. It's the majority of the, the whole population is starting to ask that question, which might be the next, the next economic model. Oh, there are alternatives. Oh, I thought, I thought Tina was, was right. You know, Tina, there is no alternative. I have heard that so many times in democracies. I think in an autocracy, it's okay to say there is no alternative, I'm the dictator. But in a democracy... I think a, polit a democratic politician should always say there are plenty of alternatives. Okay, mine is just one. Maybe my neighbor's idea is better than mine, but I go for this idea and let's have a nice conversation to figure out the best idea. Tapas, there are plenty of alternatives. And the economy for the common good is just one, at least of the several, <laughs> if not the many. But it's just a short list. The complete list, of course, is longer. And our model started in 2010 in Austria and Germany and Italy, and we try to propose a holistic approach, which means we do offer a complete and hopefully consistent theory of change. The theoretic model has 20 cornerstones, 
At the same time, we are highly participatory and a life movement. Some 5,000 volunteers are engaging in 33 countries so far. Biggest movement is in Germany with 100 local chapters in Germany. And last but not least import important, we are thinking a lot about the legal framework and the democratic process, thanks to which one day we could, we could translate this model into the, into the economic order. Because uh, it's very nice to do something nicely, to, to do something good voluntarily, but at the end of the day, we need that the legal system is supporting and promoting this way to understand and to practice the economy. Maybe just one small uh, mentioning of the of the VDEM, as we are in in in, in Sweden, the VDEM Institute, Varieties of Democracy at the University of Gothenburg, is um, publishing every year the VDEM report, and uh, it's um, distinguishing four types uh, of of state of government: uh, liberal democracies, electoral democracies electoral autocracies and closed autocracies. And over the last uh, 12 years, we lost uh, 10 out of 40 liberal democracies. So they, they declined from 40 to 30. And this year, Austria was <laughs> downgraded from a liberal to an electoral democracy. That is the empirical data because it's funded by a, or supported by a very large empirical data but the theoretical hypothesis that is, that is describing exactly the same process is the hypothesis of post-democracy by Colin Crouch. You probably know that, which means um, there are democracies, <laughs> but the quality and the substance of these democracies is in decline. And this year, um, well, Austria is not considered a liberal democracy anymore. And that's why uh, I'm mentioning that. Uh, we thought a lot about the economy, but we thought a lot as well about democracy. And there is a model behind, or I would call her a twin sister of the economy for the common good, which I call a sovereign democracy. And a sovereign democracy would be a deeper, a further developed, and a more participatory democracy than the ones we know and have today. Just to mention that uh, when you want to discuss about uh, the democratic framework as well. But now let's go for the economy. And these are some of uh, the guiding questions of the fool. <laughs> a fool always asks, what does it mean? And why should we do that? <laughs> and what's the context of uh, our endeavor? Um, so my foolish proposals are economics should offer a clear definition of economy. If you found one in your economics textbooks, please show me. Economics should be clear about the goal of the economy. There we go, towards purpose and meaning. And then economics should offer consistent metrics for success measurement, which are aligned with the agreed purpose or the agreed goal. And, well, that's a wish for Christmas. The creation of proper metrics is a political task, possibly of all the citizens. I would start economic thinking and also economic education with this kind of questions. And now a nice picture and would like to start instead of a flow diagram or a market abstraction, I would uh, start a deeper dive into economics with contextualization of the economy. And in our view, in our holistic approach, the economy is deeply embedded in human societies, ideally uh, democratic societies with their long-lasting cultural values from human dignity to sustainability, and the most important fundament of all economic activities is, not should be, but is, that's a fact, nature and planetary ecosystems, uh, which boundaries we are crossing over the past years. And as a consequence of that bigger picture, our proposal is that economic activities should serve principally the common good. Of course, the democratically defined common good, but the common good should be the overarching goal of all economic activities and not money. <laughs> That's a different possibility. It's also a normative proposal that money should be the purpose of all our economic endeavors and ambitions and striving. We think 
it's not the best idea. And actually, uh, it's almost a shame to say that this is not our evaluation or our worldview. It's a worldview. Oh, sorry, I forgot something. That's uh, just a proof of how strictly some stick to this vision that uh, it's all about making profits. It's not just um, an exaggeration. No, it exists in mainstream economics textbooks. And these textbooks don't say that's one option. And a different option is that companies can be understood as organizations to serve and increase the common good. That's another option. And now you can choose. No, that's not what we learn as economic students. What we learn is there's just one option. There is no alternative. And we learn about market laws. Although, 2,300 years ago, there was an economic teacher who was actually a philosopher. It's Aristotle. And he distinguished not only two different understandings of the economy, but he even distinguished two different terms with which he described these two different understandings of the economy. Just one of the two is oikonomia. You know, oikos nomos, the, the rules thanks to which we manage the household in order to achieve a goal. And the goal of oikonomia in Aristotle's view was the well-being of all members of that household. The general welfare, or the common good. He was, he was crystal clear about that. There was no doubt, no dialectic thought. Should we um, try to um, earn as much money as possible and at the same time try to provide the well-being of the members? No, <laughs> there was just the well-being of the members of the household. And money was considered as a means. It's extremely important, this distinction. Money, capital, any material good was considered a means and if, and the purpose was the common good, and if that relationship what was turned upside down, what would be put on its head, yeah, like this, then he said, oh, I have to first give you back the... If you put it on your head like this, then this is not economy any longer. This is something different. And he would call it rheumatistic. <laughs> Both is possible. That's not the question. We can practice rheumatistic care. That's no problem. For some of us, at least, <laughs> maybe for all of us, it would become a problem in the longer term. And that's just a different way to practice the condens oikonomia. But it's important to know the difference. And one of my wishes is that we learn that in the economic education. Did you, did you learn what Aristotle said about <laughs> economics when you studied <laughs> business administration, management, or economics? Very, very few do, but hardly anyone. Or this one. If you hear something about Adam Smith, you hear, well, the invisible hand and egoism is good because the invisible hand <laughs> is creating somehow out of all our egoisms the common good at the end of the day. Well, that's one sentence in the welfare of a nation, and you might interpret it like this, but actually it was Paul Samuelson who made this interpretation 200 years later, not in the mid of the 19th century, but, uh, but uh, of the 18th century, but in the mid of the 20th century. And since then, the invisible hand became famous, only then. And uh, the other book of Adam Smith, the theory of moral sentiments. Moral, did, you ever, did you ever think of, about moral sentiments? And he wrote a book about moral sentiments. What is a moral sentiment? This time I don't know. I do know. I have, I have an intuition. But maybe I, I give you this, this question as a gift for your later day or for your evening or for your morning routine. What, which are my moral sentiments? And there's a whole book about this. There's a hint in the quote. And I think universal benevolence is something completely different than what, what we associate with the invisible hand. And that egoistic behavior is good <laughs> because all the egoisms are aggregated to the common good at the end of the day. It's a paradox. But that's what we believe, or some of us believe, because we learn it in economic education, because Paul Samuelson um, uh, spinned it that way. Although, 
as far as I understand Adam Smith, that was not his message. Um, and the message of Aristotle, to go back, is that uh, um, literally the art of making money and to enrich ourselves, is something opposite to economy. That's why we should distinguish. Um, we don't call it schematistic, today we call it capitalism. It's exactly the same, because in capitalism, <laughs> capital is the highest value. It's tricky. It doesn't say that dignity or sustainability or democracy are no values in capitalism. It just says, in case of doubt, <laughs> capital is more important. That's capitalism from a linguistic point of view. Um, otherwise, it would be a capital-based market economy, for instance, or would find a different uh, wording. But what I want to say, capitalism is the opposite of economy, and economy is an economy for the common good by definition, or at least by origin. That's, that's the message. And the, the next good message is that uh, democratic constitutions See differently, see differently f than economics textbooks. <laughs> so whereas in economics textbooks you find utility maximization, competition orientation, pursuit of financial goals, uh, materialism and endless growth. What's that? That's the result of a study which investigated the values that are um, disseminated in economic education. It's a scientific study by social um, by social psychologists, and you see our democratic institutions were not twisted by economic education. They still <laughs> pronounce the common good even. And if we had a crematistic world order or economic order, the Bavarian constitution would say the economic activity in its entirety serves the accumulation of capital. But it doesn't. It says we, sh we want to have an economy. We do not want to have capitalism. You see, even in the last time, capital is nothing bad either. It's, but it's just a means to serve the goal. And now comes our innovation. If that is true, if that is the case, if we agree on, on the purpose, on the general purpose of the economy, that it uh, should be the common good, then this is the wrong way to measure success because um, our understanding is that success is measured alongside the achievement of the goal and not alongside the disposal or even accumulation of the means. That's why we need to distinguish <laughs> means and ends. Do you agree that uh, success measurement works alongside the achievement of the goal, first and foremost? Or should we look first at the means if we want to know if our endeavor, company, or enterprise is successful? <laughs> hmm? Well, and if we look here, what we see is means. It's not, it's not the goal. It's all about money, and that's why our proposal is to fix that and to align economic success measurement with the existing goal. We don't have to redefine the goal. The goal is in the constitutions. We might repeat this exercise in a participatory um, process, and that's our proposal. Because we might think that uh, people don't agree with the common good as an overarching goal. That's why we, we, we propose, let's ask the people. <laughs> let's ask them. And in Germany, the Federal Ministry of Environment asks the citizens of Germany um, if they want to continue with GDP as the highest metric of economic success, or if they prefer to replace it by something like the gross national happiness. <laughs> and the answer was that 18%, uh, 1.8% supported uh, con continuing with GDP, whereas 67% uh, preferred to shift and switch to cross-national happiness in Germany. It was a representative survey um, among the citizens. The next question will be, what is the common good? <laughs> so if you are invited to define the common good, what would you say? I, I, I make my question more precise. If you could name the, the, the 10 or 20 components 
of the highest possible quality of life, of a good life for all of us, of the greater good, the common good. Which components would you like to be included? Please just speak them out. Health, education, safety, housing, freedom, food, 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 <laughs> for thought and for soul and for body and for hearts. Stability, Wi-Fi, wi -Fi. <laughs> Let, let's see if this is going to be amongst the winners at the end. <laughs> Music, wow. Yeah. Sorry? Clean water. Drinkable rivers, how about that? Uh, and one more? Love. Okay, um, wherever, whenever people are asked to answer the questions, money, capital, or luxury never ever plays a role. Not even a subordinated role, no role at all. So our proposal is to ask the citizens in a city, in a region, in a country, maybe in the European Union, uh, what, what are the most important ingredients of the commonly composed common good? And probably we will have hundreds of proposals, but then we sort out the 20 most powerful ones. And the, these finalists will be the 20 sub-goals of the common good product. And uh, then we operationalize these 20 goals. We make them measurable. Health was the first one. Uh, how could we operational health? We could say that we measure life expectancy, but that is becoming more and more obsolete. What is today preferred is to measure healthy and pleasurable years of life <laughs> as, a, as an indicator. And the indicators we can measure precisely although the goal is very abstract and very general, but the indicators we can measure precisely, and then we can compare the common good product of, uh, of this year with the score of last year, or with Finland or Norway or Denmark or Austria, if we want to do so. Yes, um, that's our proposal. That's the main proposal for the economy. And for business, it would be, it would be a variant a derivation, an easy exercise. We ask every endeavor, organization, business, company, or, uh, what's your contribution to these 20 sub-goals of the common good product? That would be our preferred common good balance sheet. As this democratic exercise hasn't taken place yet in any part of the world, we have studies, we have surveys, we have um, visions, we have dreams, we have everything, but we have no result, no precise result of a democratic process. That's why uh, here is an interimistic um, offer, how to create a common goal balance sheet. And our methodology is we look up in constitutions which are the most frequent fundamental democratic values. In constitutions. So these are not our favorite private values. These are constitutional values, human dignity, Solidarity, justice, sustainability, and you can call it democracy. We made it a little bit more precise, transparency and co-determination. And in the common goal balance sheet, we measure, it's a scorecard, you see, um, how consequently and how seriously an organization, uh, not necessarily a, a business organization, lifts these values um, with all its stakeholders, from the beginning of the supply chain to the seventh generation in the future. That's it, an 11-year-old um, girl from Barcelona said, Christian, um, wow, that's actually the economy of tomorrow that we children from today are desiring. And uh, just to get sure if I got you right, uh, I understood that the common goal balance sheet me measures, measures, it's not only evaluate, it's measuring, we see that, um, how purposeful the products and services of a company are. And how do we measure purposefulness? Our proposal is, and this has to do with the definition of economy. Now we need the, the relationship to the macro. Our definition of the economy is the satisfaction of basic human needs of, of course, not only living, but also future generations 
in alignment with the more fundamental democratic values, solidarity, justice, etc., and within the ecological planetary boundaries. That is our, our proposal, how we could define economic activities or the economy. And that's why, as a consequence, we measure, we measure the purposefulness of a product, how much, how, how, how much does it satisfy basic human needs, and then with which ecological footprint and with which uh, social um, externalities. <laughs> and of course, we would choose the, <laughs> the, the least externalities and the smallest ecological footprint. So, Victoria, I'm sorry, it was Victoria's <laughs> elevator pitch. She said how purposeful the product is, um, what's the impact on the environment, biodiversity, climate, water, air, how humane are working conditions in this uh, company, but in the whole supply chain, who takes decisions, and who gets the benefits, the fruits of the collective work. Of course, that's just a summary, but I think it's a brilliant summary because these are the fundamental ethical questions. And uh, of course, there's a lot, not only a lot of thinking, but also a lot of many pages behind, 150 pages behind. The small version is 70 pages. And um, now comes maybe the most important innovation because you could, you could evaluate as well, it's just another sustainability reporting tool. Um, well, we would like to add on uh, just another sustainability reporting tool. Uh, we propose that these sustainability reporting tools uh, are standardized, that uh, companies have to produce comparable results, that results are audited externally, not by the financial auditor, but by the ethical auditor, and that the score is quantitative, not in monetary terms, but for instance, in points, in common good points. And, and then, in a, in a first round, market participants from consumers to investors have a much more complete uh, basis of information for their decisions. That's one. And now comes the more important. <laughs> Today, uh, the companies that do better, that uh, respect and protect the climate and human rights and labor rights and pay higher wages and offer a higher degree of social security, and so they have higher costs. They have higher market prices and they have a competitive disadvantage. Whereas those who disrespect these values have a competitive advantage. And we think that's another perverse, it's a perverted system. And we would like to correct that system. We put, would like to put the system on its feet, from its head on its feet. And uh, how could we do that? Well, we could link the common good balance sheet result or the result of the non-financial report. We don't stick to our terminology, although we love it, but we could link the result of that uh, scheme to differentiated tax rates, to differentiated uh, market access, to differentiated finance conditions at banks. You can only be listed at a stock market if you get a minimum score of, let's say, 500 points. Uh, prior and, and every city could start with this priority in public procurement and uh, in uh, economic promotion programs. The hub, the, the impact hub, should only allow companies that do either a common goal balance sheet or become a B Corp or do the Future Fit Foundation standard. Any of these standards that creates a comparable and measurable result. That should be the condition. And only these companies are allowed to be part of the impact hub. We, we, we want to become as transparent and as comparable as with the financial balance sheet. And as a consequence, it would still be a market economy, but it would not be a capitalistic market economy based on profit maximization and counterpetition. Once again, one last time, I'm a linguist. Competition uh, in Latin means to to search together for the best solution. I'm, I'm in extremely in favor of competition, but if companies act one against the other, that in correct Latin terms would be counterpetition. If one searches against the other company for the best individual solution at the cost of others. Uh, so it would shift to common good creation and cooperation or a true competition. And just, yeah, 
if you wonder, and how could we operationalize co cooperation without creating monopolies? <laughs> in, in the capitalistic uh, logic, cooperation leads to something bad, uh, to monopolies or oligopolies, because uh, the, the goal is different. The goal is um, utility maximization of, of a company. And uh, cooperation is a tool to harm others. <laughs> In a common good economy, the goal is different. It's how can I do good to others? And cooperation turns into a tool to benefit others. And maybe you have read the slide. In the meantime, if companies act aggressively one against the other, they, they meet um, strong negative incentives. If they just ignore each other, they meet uh, soft negative incentives. If they cooperate occasionally, they meet soft positive incentives. And if they cooperate systemically, like Mykorrhiza in, 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 the, in the Wood Wide Web, you know, <laughs> the Wood Wide Web, the, 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 the Mykorrhiza who, uh, th through which trees uh, cooperate systemically and elder trees give uh, um, nourish, uh, are nourishing younger trees, you know that. So those companies who be behave like them, they would meet strong positive incentives. It would be a true alternative, just one possible, you said it very nicely, um, uh, just one possible alternative to the extremes, capitalism and socialism. That's my message. I consider capitalism, in, of course, in its pure form, in its purest form, it's possibly never existed. But uh, we, first we think, then we act. At least, <laughs> uh, at least then we enact our values in laws. <laughs> And uh, so theoretical, there is a pure capitalism possible and there's a pure socialism possible. And we would place uh, the economy for the common good just in between. And I think that's it. Um, yes, maybe just uh, finishing with some pictures. I think my time is, is almost over. Let's see if I see it the time. Um, just some pictures. We started uh, 12 years ago now with small and medium-sized companies now it's uh, 3,000 that are supporting the movement and 1,000 have done a common good balance sheet. But not only companies, we will see it's um, also municipalities and even universities. And of course, from all branches, um, organic agriculture. Um, maybe this is a nice story from a baker, which is, dis is uh, practicing disobedience against the law of, of, of offer and demand, in the meaning that not when the harvest uh, is brilliant, prices drop, and when the harvest is bad, prices shoot up. No, uh, he's inviting the whole value chain around the circle every year. The, the, the corn farmers and the, the habitual clients and, and the employees and, uh, and the owners of the bakery and at this table, they ask the corn farmers, which price do you need this year in order to have a good, uh, a good livelihood? And then there is a bit of silence. They look at each other's eyes deeply, and then the corn farmers um, name a price. And since 25 years, this price has been paid without negotiation, and it works for everybody. Just one example. Um, maybe as Adam Smith is talking about the butcher, the brewer, and the baker, I was recently in a, in a brewery um, in Westerwald in Germany, and they have done their first common good balance sheet, and as a result, they, they became aware of where they were su supplying from. It was from many nations, and from, sorry, from far away, and their decision was that we, we want to shorten the supply chains to a radius of 100 kilometers. That's, that's the goal. That's, that's uh, groundbreaking. We have uh, eight uh, small and tiny banks so far, no big one. <laughs> um, just one example, this uh, bank in Munich, they uh, eliminated the whole bonus system because they uh, realized that the bonus system made that, uh, that the, the sellers uh, pushed products no matter if clients needed them or not. Just one example. Now there are companies that say, we, we ask our, we don't sell, uh, not even if the clients wish something, we sell it, no, we, we, we make a pause and we ask, are, are you sure that you really want and need that? 
And maybe, maybe the outcome is that the client really wants and needs that. But the outcome could also be um, the client needs it, but later, or needs something different from the same company, or something different which only is sold by a different company. <laughs> this is systemic cooperation. Or maybe it uh, doesn't need anything buyable at all, and just needs love, or a hug, or comfort, or company. Okay, and um, this is a public company, so not only private, also it's a health insurer, and they got the, the price at the climate conference because they, they convinced without nudges and, of course, without uh, enforcement. Uh, wow, thank you. <laughs> That's powerful. <laughs> With conviction is <laughs> the most powerful um, um, uh, strategy. Um, to consume less meat, huh? which is good for the health of the people, but also for the health of the planet. Okay, I think I'm going to the end. Uh, we also have communities and uh, scient uh, scientific area, and uh, furthermore, we're going to try to bring these ideas into the legal framework, and this is just one last good message. The European Economic and Social Committee which is not part of the legislative process, but at least it's an official part of the European Union, um, issued an opinion on the economy for the common good, and it was submitted to, uh, to voting, and 86% of the members of the European Economic and Social Committee voted in favor of the inclusion of the economy for the common good into the legal framework of the European Union and member states. This is um, um, wind from behind, Okay, that's it. Thank you for listening. Thank you for being open and curious. And I'm now uh, delighted to, to discuss and, uh, and try to give not too foolish answers to your irritating questions. <laughs> Thank you so much.